Good evening. I'm Jim Laurel with the Public Works Department here to talk about the Class Park grant application. Uh, I have with me um, Stephen Simpson and Lauren Simpson from Simpson Associates. They're going to provide an update on the status of the project design here when I'm done speaking. Um, I'm going to talk just for a couple of minutes about the uh, about project budget um, items. I'll put together an updated summary table for the committee members. Um, I want to hand out to you. There were, um, there were questions that the committee had on the grant application, and when I went, I went back and when I was responding to those, I looked back at the original uh, grant application and realized that it wasn't really as descriptive as it could have been in terms of the work that was, uh, that was scheduled to be done. So I put together the summary table, um, hopefully to um, keep the numbers, um, to make the numbers a little bit clearer. So when you look at the table, in the upper left-hand side of the table is a box that for $194,500, that's the grant that the CPA had already awarded the project for the work that Simpson is doing for the city now. As you slide over to the right, um, there's a CPA grant to budget um, number for the Overlook expansion. And the number in red, if you go to the bottom of the column, is $129,000. That's for work associated with the design, uh, schematic design, design development, and construction documents for the Overlook expansion of the park, which wasn't included in the original grant application. And then it also includes uh, $10,000 for bidding uh, services, construction administration with a budget of $32,500, and construction observation or inspection for two contracts, two construction contracts, also at $32,500. So the total there for um, Simpson Associates is $129,000. And then at the bottom is a Pulaski Park construction cost summary item there that shows um, the fact that we're, we're proposing to break the project up into two phases. The phase one construction budget is $1.575 million. Um, on Monday, the city received a park grant from the state in the amount of $400,000. With the, the balance for the phase one construction of $1.175 million. The phase two construction budget for the park expansion down into the roundhouse lot in the area that's been called the Overlook Canal uh, up until now. The budget there is $625,000 with a, a future park grant application for the amount of $400,000 that we'll be applying for in the next fiscal year. And the matching city funding for that park grant uh, would be $225,000. So the, the sum total uh, for project construction is $2.2 million that was described in the CPA grant application. And the current CPA uh, application total is $1.529 million. So that was as it was identified in the grant application. And this just provides a little bit more of a breakdown that shows the direction of the project in terms of um, the two phases that we're looking at to uh, to maximize the amount of state grant money that we hope to get in order to, to complete the project. So what I'd like to do now is have um, Steve and Lauren provide an update on the status of the project and where the, the park renovation and expansion is going, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions about that. So I think we have about um, three minutes left in some of you weren't part of the schematic design process, and what we wanted to do is walk you through the work that we've done to date briefly so that you can get an understanding of the current site plan and then where we're headed. So we started this whole process with a series of three design charrettes, we'll call them, public meetings where we got a lot of great feedback. This was from meeting number one. We had over 75 people attend. We went over our you know, two-hour limit, and people just were so excited. We had basically a full house at the senior center. And at the first meeting, we presented a blank slate. We brought in the, I feel like I should turn you, we brought in the, um, the site plan as it exists, the existing conditions, and we had people tell us 
candidly what they liked, what they didn't like, and what they thought um, could be an improvement in the park. So we ended up with a series of comments that we ended up, I'm gonna show you, this is, this is the largest <coughs> comment sheet that we got back, which was needs improvement. Um, so it was clear that there was a lot of impetus for change at this site that people were really giving us a lot of information on. At the second meeting, we presented a few options for a site plan, and we asked people to give comments on that. So again, people afterwards were able to come up and literally write notes and comments on areas of the park that they had any feedback on. Again, very interactive. So what we've ended up with is a, a project that's organized by a series of spaces. Main Street is at the top, Academy Music on the left, Memorial Hall on the right, so North is up. A series of spaces that are defined by specific landscape characters, depending on sort of program and use. So we know we have this very civic public plaza by the Main Street edge. Everyone felt agreement on that, and they have, we have active um, things like movable tables and chairs, uh, attractive lighting, some kind of uh, connection between the Academy and Memorial Hall, the bus stop. Um, and then we have a large central green space in the middle that, again, is a civic space, but becomes more embedded in the park landscape. On the right-hand side, we've got this blue um, vertical element on the slide that is essentially some kind of water feature. And the way it ended up being designed was that it's actually a stormwater feature that takes the site runoff and perhaps even a little bit of runoff from Main Street as this big demonstrative tool, this gesture saying, you know, hey, this city is really progressive. We're gonna take some of that runoff from the city, have a curb cut, put it into the park, treat it and clean it before it goes back into the Connecticut River. And then this other large green area, darker green area, is what we're calling woodland. Um, garden, more passive, um, lots of different things happen in that area, maybe nature play. So all of these elements we started to organize in certain areas based on the feedback that we were getting. So this was the plan that we came up with, and now I've zoomed out, because what we discovered in the three site charrettes and, uh, and design charrettes were that People were really interested in not just this zone right here that everyone knows today. Right now there's a chain link fence that runs across the top of the hill. But people were really interested in this hillside and the connection to the rail trail. So it was actually fascinating because we thought about that when we went to the site. We thought, you know, this is kind of a hidden opportunity, but we never designed it that way, especially earlier on, you know, eight years ago in the competition. And it was actually the community that said, hey, you know, let's not turn our back on this. We have 20 feet of grade change. Isn't there some opportunity here? So we came up with a design that basically is twofold. One is this large civic space that fronts Main Street and has a relationship to all the activity and the energy of Main Street and works with the fabric and the scale of the buildings. And then we have a second space as you move south that actually engages with this hillside and occupies it in a way that is actually a unique opportunity that we are trying to activate. We're showing Roundhouse Lot right now. Obviously, there's a big discussion again. There's committees you know, here towards what the Roundhouse Lot would be. Um, we were showing gr the greening of the Roundhouse Lot and a connection, you know, maybe a, a, a paving pattern that connects people to the rail trail physically. Right now, we're in design development, and we're actually studying this hillside more closely. We're looking at maybe swapping the way um, we make this this accessible. Just to explain the zigzagging is so that we can literally, you know, someone in a wheelchair or someone with a bicycle or a, a pram or push uh, push stroller can actually walk their um, their way up the or push their way up the uh, overlooks without having to walk on the stairs. So these are some views of Perhaps if you're standing on Main Street looking towards the park, uh, the academy would be on the right. The bus stop has been reconfigured to engage the plaza. Uh, some of the trees that we're working with the city arborist um, to figure out which of the trees are viable in terms of their health. Uh, we're saving as many as we can. But the ones in the front that actually face Main Street, we think that the, several of the lower ones of the dogwoods are a, a barrier into the park. And that was something that a lot of people at the meetings actually commented on. 
So right now we're showing this grove of hawthorn. It could be something else. Honey locust was another um, idea of shade tree, but just an idea is it's a plaza. It's a, it's an, a more open space. It's flexible, movable tables and chairs and benches, some sort of a water feature that feeds this bioswale. This is another view of that area. So you can look actually from Main Street as if you're coming across the crosswalk into the plaza, underneath the trees, through the trees, see the green space beyond. We've seen in a lot of um, cities, I think we got excited, we had been to Philadelphia, and I don't know if anyone here has been there recently, but in the summer they have this really wonderful program where the garden, um, I, I think it's called like Garden City, um, and it's basically this cooperative of horticulturalists and gardeners, and they come up with this movable um, garden spaces. Sometimes it's associated with a brewery or a restaurant or you know, the, the Independence Mall, and they actually have these pop-up gardens. And you're imagining some kind of energy happening here in this, in this city with uh, perhaps different types of plants that come in and out of the space. And at night, of course, engaging with the nightlife here impromptu events and um, gatherings, night lighting, and something that feels inviting and more vibrant than what the city is. This is a view as if you're standing on the overlook looking back towards the park um, through this area called what we're saying is nature play. We're not defining it as a playground. There's a big push at the community meetings to have a play area for children. And if you look at the board right here on the right is a more uh, recent rendition of what we're studying. Nature play is something that was pushed very strongly. There were a lot of parents there, um, several kids that were at the meeting actually, um, every time, at every three meetings, each of the three meetings. And nature play and some of those images were things that people were really pushing for, something a little bit different. Uh, the Bridge Street Playground, we know that was recently constructed. That's a that's a different type of playground, more conventional type, and that's great. And because this is a small space, we know that we don't have a lot of room to have large play equipment. And so we're looking at something a little bit different, just like everything else is in this park. Mm -hmm. This is a view as if you're coming across the crosswalk and you're walking through the plaza in this uh, bioswale, stormwater garden is on your right. So it's meant to be a wild planting that's contained in a channel, reminiscent of the plants you might see if you were taking a walk <coughs> along the at riverbanks. And this bioswale is doing a job. It's instead of being a series of catch basins on the site where the water just goes in and you never see it, and it goes in dirty, it comes out dirty on the Connecticut River eventually when it runs its way through the stormwater system. Instead, the plants cleanse that water, the plants get the water so they grow healthier, and it becomes this visible landscape element that says, you know, this is, a, this is an ethic that this city has, and we're investing landscape as infrastructure instead of relying on conventional stormwater treatment systems. So this is sort of a spring view. Uh, the woodland garden, you can see the ground plane over here. This is a, a different feeling than you know, the, the open green space. And I think there was an interest in some more contemplative spaces, quieter spaces in the park. So that's what we're trying to show gathering uh, adventures. I did point out this is the Velocity Memorial associated with this informal stage that stretches across the bioswale into the garden, I mean into the um, green space. This is a winter view. We've been very conscious of the fact that we're in New England. We're in Western Mass, zone five for plant hardiness. We have a lot of winds and a tunnel effect to deal with and a lot of harsh winters. Um, so we want seasonal interest. On the left-hand side, we're showing some winterberry, which have beautiful fruit in the winter. Uh, we are showing, I mean, the grasses in the bioswale, honestly, the, when you're driving through that, the, the road, the back road, I think most of you know it from Amherst, through Hadley Meadows, and you look right over the rail trail, there's beautiful fields there in the winter, and you see the grasses poking up with the snow over them. It's a nice, it's a nice image. So we want to bring some of that agriculture to this this uh, park. This is the, the new evergreen holiday tree. And in all of our discussions with the community, it was a little bit of a back and forth at the beginning. Some folks at some tables really felt strongly about keeping it. But in the end, most people said, it's in the way. It blocks the view to the park. And if we can have a new holiday tree in a location that makes sense, more people can gather around it, 
let's do it. So we're showing it right at the end of the focal point, right above the overlook. This is an existing view of that rear sort of back of house of the park. It's kind of amazing. This area, the 20 feet of grade change, a series of concrete retaining walls that are sort of in shambles, a lot of um, pines and evergreens that were actually planted, I think, um, by your father's firm <laughs> originally when they did the design. And some of them at the time, they were great, but they've sort of outgrown themselves. They're now a barrier. Some are weedy, some are dying. So most of those are going to come down. This deciduous trees that are heritage and native trees that give a lot of canopy and wonderful dappled light to the park, we're going to keep. But the pines that are in uh, overgrown state are basically, are, are, are proposed to be removed. So that it makes a connection between this area and the rest of the park. So this is an existing view. And this is a proposed view of how that might look. So we're looking at negotiating you know, all of this grade change by slicing this path through with a series of spaces that you occupy the hillside with. So benches for gathering and uh, a new generous stair on this side that connects people more directly to the um, rail trail. What we might actually do, we're studying this, we're looking at actually moving that to this side again because I'm realizing the way the grades worked this worked out during snap design, but now we're studying maybe it's better to move people all the way to this side so they aren't dumped in the middle of the parking lot. So all these things are what we're starting to think about in design development. So this is a nighttime view of perhaps a few times a month in the summer, and one of these inflatable or you know movable movie theaters comes in, and you actually have a large event there in a kind of movie night. So. We're really excited about this project, and we kind of feel like we did the hardest part, which was getting community consensus and getting great ideas out of people and getting everybody on the same page. Everybody meaning enough people to get excited about it so that we can move forward and have a final schematic design plan. Building it and designing it moving forward is an easier part for us. Because what we needed was a design that was solid for the community could stand behind. So we're proud of where we are now, and we're excited to move forward. But we're here tonight to ask for your support. Thanks. So um, with the park grant uh, that was awarded by the state on Monday, um, if matching funds are provided through the CPA grant, we can get starting. Um, Bidding for construction in spring of 2015 and construction going to the center. For the renovation of the park, the overlook expansion elements of the park that Lauren just described uh, would happen in 2016 pending um, a second plan in the city that will allow us to do that. So, uh, would be happy to answer any questions about the presentation or information in the grant application. The uh, $400,000 park grant that you received on Monday, what are the stipulations of when that has to be used by? Um, that's a good question. I haven't seen the grant contract. Um, I know that we can't spend it until, I want to say July, July of 2015. <coughs> I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. What's the feasibility of getting a second park ramp two years in a row? That's a good question. Um, I think the city's um, the city has been quite successful in getting park ramps in the past. Um, I think uh, in many, that many be a liability actually. It could be. I thought actually I thought it might have been a liability issue. Uh, it turned out not to be a liability. Um, one of the benefits that we have in an application next year is that the oval um, construction involves redevelopment of a, of a site that's a mass contingency hazardous waste site because of the old gas company work there. So that raises uh, some of the points that we get in the review of that. Mm -hmm. So I think that aids our application in the future. But in terms of what we would look at building, 
um, with the first park grant and the matching money from the city, we would look for that to be pretty much a standalone project, right? We don't want to build something and then leave something undone because we didn't get state grant money. So we would be careful in how we look at phasing the project so that when the first project is done, if for some reason the second project doesn't go in a year or for a couple of years, that you're not left with something um, that's not suitable. So we're, we would be very careful. <coughs> joint that we drew in the concrete so this is meant to all be flush okay it's it's definitely meant to be flush. looks like a step I yeah, it looks like a step and level. you're the second person who said that and, and then the other question is just for reassurance the area behind the academy of music that's currently used as an informal parking lot right that just will be handled right that jim you may want to add to this i, I don't want to speak out of line but it yeah it really it's a question for you actually in turn, yes, we, we're we're looking at coordinating the park improvements with the parking situation with that <coughs> academy. Um, it's sort of a uh, it's very much a jumble back there sometimes with a lot of vehicles parking, and we're trying to come up with something that. Um, the driving over sidewalks mm -hmm. to get there is really what alarms me. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I I, I think. Historically, they need to get access in, in, in the, and they will still need to get access to the back of the academy um, because of equipment and, and things that are needed for the shows that go on there. The other parking um, that happens with employees or whatever, I can't really speak to that. I think what we're what we're trying to do is is to be true to the improvement behind the academy so that we can make that a functional space so that they can get to the loading dock door and, and do the things that they've traditionally done in a way that um, integrates uh, nicely with the park. Uh, and that doesn't answer the question about the park. <laughs> well, and I don't, think I, I don't think I have an answer to that question. I think we need to answer that question. I think well, we could say from the, the plan that we designed, is there anyone here from the Academy of Music? <laughs> Just want to make sure. I mean, we we drew this, and the director definitely said, "Whoa, where's all my parking?" And we said, "Sorry, but we don't think it should be there." So I'll just be honest that as landscape architects of this park, and our mission is to, you know, give them what they need, but according to what the city has told us, they shouldn't be parking vehicles behind there. Well, and let me confirm, it is city property. It, it is, and actually, I, I don't know. I've only been working. We've been working with with Simpson on the park and the park land, and it's, it's the academy in their property is right. And it's all city property, but how they function and what they do is right next to the park. But I can't say that. I don't feel like I have any any control over it. I think you raise a good question. I'm happy to look at and, and talk to the planning department and the director of public works to see if there's something that can be done or related to safety and things there. But I. Yeah. I I don't feel that's reassuring enough. I think if we're going into this scale of project in the park, we need to actually make some decisions about how that end of the property is used. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it's all about getting stage equipment in because there's the side door that is designed for that and it's built asphalted right up to it. And so I think a lot of it is just parking, but I agree. I, I don't, I don't say we have to decide it here, but it would seem to me that's a point to be decided. Well, maybe just to share a, a first idea, although we've been looking at this for a while now, it may not be resolved, but it is what we felt important is important is to not have access to the back of the academy off of this sidewalk. Currently today, there's a lot of movement of vehicles that can go from the sidewalk down here all the way up and around the street. So we'd like to protect the tree 
try to reclaim some ground to the tree, create a safe drop curb and access for a vehicle. Now, you, the reality is in order to have the turning radii for a truck to get in, you could also have several cars parking there when the truck isn't using that space because you need, you need room for that swing. So I think that we, we can accommodate some temporary spaces. Our goal is to make sure that we have complete separation here because of what's happening in the park and separation from this major pedestrian way. So that's where we are at the moment. This is design development. It's by no means done, but I think the intent uh, from our point of view is, is indicated here. What I, the, the budget handout that you gave to us, the um, phase two would not have to be funded this round. Is that correct? Okay. And so the the one point one seven five is for the uh, the phase one construction. Um, and explain again what the other. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't get the other one hundred twenty nine. So the 129,000 is for the city to contract with Simpson Associates to design the expansion, the overlook expansion of the park, and also for them to provide assistance to the city during the construction of the two phases of the work. So the grant application makes the project, <coughs> the renovation and expansion whole. What if we were to, to offer partial funding for this? Is it, does, is it all or nothing? It is not. I don't know what that number is. The, um, the construction funding for phase two, which is the 225000 wouldn't be necessary right now. How much of the 129 would be necessary? Well, it makes sense, Jim, I just want to, I think it makes sense to, for this project to be designed holistically, as opposed to um, part of these fees, the I reason that the top, the top fees really to the overlook, the design of the overlook. And so it makes sense to design a, a design development package and a construction document package that is holistic for the I, entire project. Right, I would agree. So the 54,000, which is design development for the overlook, is important for that to be done now. Um, because we're looking at phasing the project, and the only way we can determine how best to phase it is to design sort of the whole project and then look at ways to break it into two construction projects. So we need detailed design plans, we need detailed cost estimates to figure out which elements will go in 2015, what elements would go in 2016, um, so that we can break it up in a way that makes sense. So if you were gonna break uh, the, the two contracts, the, uh, the 75 grand at the bottom there for, for bidding services, construction admin and construction observation, that some, some part of that um, wouldn't be needed now because it would be needed for the second contract. And I'd have to look at the details to figure out how to break that up. But it wouldn't necessarily be in half because the renovation project is, is larger than the overlook project. It would be like two thirds, one third, Roughly. maybe. Any further questions? All right, thank you. And I guess we will then move on to the next project on the agenda, which is Historic Northampton Infrastructure Renovations. <laughs> Nancy Rexford. I'm the new acting director at Historic Northampton. I have with me to help me out Chris Thompson here in the front row. Who, oh, and Steve, you're here too. And Barbara, I think, Blumenthal in the back uh, are, are on our board of uh, trustees. Um, while she's getting it set up, um, 
we've gone through staff changes over the last couple of years, and I just started this job on October 1st. And um, I used to work here uh, at Historic Northampton back from 1975 to 1987, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Thank you. Uh, pretty familiar with the um, organization and the town, um, at least as it was 40 years ago. <laughs> Very historic. Um, so, so you should, uh, It goes very fast, so it actually be easier for some time. It's very strange in the Everything is not supposed to be in magenta. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sorry because it was really pretty. <laughs> it was really nice. Um, so, um, in these last, the first four weeks that I've been on this job, um, I did, uh, with Chris's help, I did a kind of an assessment of, of all of our needs. And so our our understanding of the of the needs of the property has changed a bit since we did the, the grant application though not so radically, I think, as to require major um, adjustment. Um, most of the major adjustments are that we're going to be doing a lot of things on our own. When, when you asked your follow-up questions, which I thought were really very penetrating and thoughtful, and I appreciated being asked to think about them. Um, but the message that underlay them, I thought, was that you have a lot of proposals and that you're going to have to um, either phase this project or fund part of it. And I can understand how that would be. So my thinking a lot has been, what can we do to reduce the cost? And where do we really need your help? Um, so I'm going to try to give some sense of that in this in this video. Oh, that's good. Whatever it did, it's much better. Um, so for those of you who aren't terribly familiar with us, um, we have three historic houses that are right next to each other on Bridge Street across from the post office and a barn. And it's when you come in from the Amherst end, it kind of is that gateway to the, the downtown, you know, one of the first major institutional things that you see in this town. Oops. Okay. Um, we, we have major collections ranging from very old, like the uh, Pomeroy Anvil from the 1650s, to, am I talking too much? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to uh, things that are quite recent, like the fire station button, which I gather is in 1996. Let me try this one. Um, we have major collections of photographs and archival materials, um, many of Northampton businesses. We have, um, we, we are very interested in documenting Northampton business, and one of the biggest collections we have is from ProBrush, which used to be the Florence Manufacturing. Um, so this is supposed to go Click, 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 you know, not, not forever. Um, we have a major costume collection. It's known all over the, <laughs> all over the country. It has beautiful dresses in it. They're not all blue. <laughs> <laughs> and we have things that, that belong to fairly famous people. Uh, the Robin Hood outfit was made by Grace Coolidge for her son. Um, that was her handbag in the middle, and the chair on the right was had a seat was worn was was sat in and woven by Sally Mammonash, who is identified as the last Indian, a phrase which says as much about the people who called her that as it does about her. But she was recognized; she sort of recognized to hold that position in that version of history, uh, and it's an important 
important piece. The Historical Society has tried to do a lot of outreach. Um, there are a bunch of historic markers that have been uh, put in recently, um, notably a series on abolition um, that have connected materials on our website. Uh, these are some of the photographs. So everything's very wide, incidentally. It's not the normal, normal scale that you're seeing. We have a famous local artist, very fine artist, Charles Burley, um, who was painting in the 1880s. Um, but we also um, cater to modern artists, um, today's artists, in a series called Contemporary Art in Historic Northampton. We use it. Did we use the same thing last time? Mm -hmm. um, if it's any consolation to you, we're used to the quirky. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it really out. makes yeah. you, I, I really feel like I'm losing my rhythm here. So. Um, don't, don't worry about it. We just need to send you a message. Um, so these are some examples from, from um, those, that's a series where artists are, take inspiration from some of the objects in our collection, and that's usually coupled with a, a lecture. So um, uh, somebody who um, did a series of photographs of the location of the old canal, mm -hmm. um, there's a, a big lecture that was well, well attended. Um, and then in May, we had a, a project called Midnight to Midnight, um, where we were trying to bring, it, it was an idea that I had had actually many, many years ago, like back in 1980, I wanted to do this in Northampton. Um, because I had this concept that instead of us being the people who doled out history from two to four on Tuesday afternoons, <coughs> that our real role was to create structures whereby um, the residents of, of a town in Northampton could preserve their own history. So Midnight to Midnight was an effort to create a project where people could create their, the archive by which they would want the town to be remembered. And we create the structure for preserving it, for publicizing it. And that's how that was supposed to work. And we had a nice ice cream social and people really enjoyed it. So there are a lot of interesting things going on. One of the things that I'm working on right at the moment is this is the most recent picture, um, the back of Parsons House with its weeds cut down, which happened this afternoon. Um, and we hope to have an um, archaeological dig there next spring. And uh, it's an only the, like, I have this idea, two people having an idea together at stage. But what we hope to do um, is to get a Mass Foundation for the Humanities grant, do some teaching about the archaeological digs mm -hmm. for both the adult public and school people. We're right next to Bridge Street School. We have a nice relationship with them. They have a community garden in the back of the house. And, um, and to allow the children to come in and have the experience of digging um, in, a, in a community dig that is overseen, however, by a professional. And that professional is likely to be Linda Ziegenbein. So um, I can't promise that. But that's the kind of thing that um, we're trying to draw the community into our area and provide services for the community. The little picture on the left is some um, things that came out of a wonderful dig that was done at Damon House back in 1985. So the place doesn't look too bad from the outside. It's a pretty house, green lawns. But when you start taking a closer look, as Chris and I did the last three weeks, you see a lot of problems. This is my to-do list, or it was a few weeks ago before I added to it. Um, and this is me with an empty <laughs> purse. <laughs> I, uh, you know, you just, I, I feel like you wouldn't want to look at this lady's underwear because, you know, the dress is great on the outside, but, but I don't know what's going on. On the inside. <coughs> So here's some pictures of the problems that I am currently facing in my in these three houses and that's me in the middle banging my head uh, because there's so much to do so we picked three things at the time when we did this grant proposal we talked about um, new boilers and furnaces we talked about mold remediation we talked about uh, jacking up the back of Parsons house so I'm going to and the question naturally came back, why are the new boilers or furnaces important for the collections? And in part, you can make the argument that 
our collections are too close to the, um, the, the, both the furnaces and the oil tanks. But I also want to just be upfront about this argument, which is money. And if you look at that, which in the original is a circle as opposed to an oval, um, and you look at you know, people, staff is always your biggest expense. And right now it's a little less because when we lost Nan, I came to work, I'm working full time and I'm not, not taking any pay in order to try to fix the problems that this organization is facing. So the staff is a little less. But you can see the size of oil and property maintenance. Down in office, you've got um, your internet and your telephone and things like that. And uh, we have to have insurance uh, for the properties. And that tiny little sliver is all we have for, for programs and exhibitions and collection care. There's something wrong with this picture. And part of the picture is we're spending over $20,000 a year on oil. So we felt we absolutely had to do something about the heating and the budget. So the first thing we did in Parsons House, that was in the middle, was our antique snowman furnace um, covered with asbestos. And over in the left-hand corner, you'll see the asbestos dripping down on the floor. Um, and we could get funding for about half of it from the Parsons Family Association, which um, supports our caretaking of this house. So we have it. We have a half of that. But as soon as I sent them all these pictures, I'm sure they will come back with the second half of that, that 7,000. Um, so we had the asbestos already taken off and the, and the new boiler put in um, so that we expect we will save half of our heating costs in that house this year which is why we didn't want to wait. So this puts part of the project. It's the part that is part of our match and our contribution. It had to come first, or we wouldn't get the savings for the year. And that's the reason it was done that way. Continuing about oil tanks, this gives you some idea. On the left, this is Damon House, in this case, where the basement has been used for storage. It was set up that way in my era. And when it was set up, it was clean. Um, it had a dehumidifier, which was functioning. It was organized. It was things were covered out of the dust, and it was perfectly functional um, collection storage. In the interim, people forgot how important it was to keep the dehumidifier going. There's mold over everything. There's disorganization. People throw their junk that they don't want to make a decision down there, and I have one hell of a job to clean it up. That's the oil tank over there on the right. These are all the fragile baskets on the left. Uh, you'll see a painted, sponge painted blanket chest, which is a beautiful kind of teal colored piece with a sheet over it. And it's, it is smack dab up against the, the um, oil tank. This is one of the reasons I'm a little concerned about the oil tank. Um, there's a lot of asbestos. This happens to be a, a view of Shepherd House. One of the questions you asked was, well, is the asbestos actually in such bad shape? And I did finally get time to go, go look and bring my camera over. And these are three pictures of as, asbestos in Shepherd House, which is it's all 275 feet of asbestos. The one on the left is, is completely hanging off the pipe. I don't know if you can even, it's, it had some kind of scotch tapey thing, broad scotch tape to hold it on, and that has since failed. It's obviously been repaired many times. In, uh, um, more problems. Okay. We also had um, discovered right when I was answering your follow-up questions, we discovered um, asbestos problems in Damon House. And, um, and if you look at the lower, uh, lower right-hand corner, the kind of larger picture, you will see an ugly greeny-gray stain that is the water dripping from the non-functional flashing in the chimney down through the asbestos and the food pipe and onto the collections that are being stored right underneath. So it's not a great situation. On the left, you can see the furnace itself, um, and it's right next to the collections as well. Um, this is what the Damon basement looks like um, on both the left and the right side. Um, it needs a lot of work. Um, every single thing that I've looked at in there is, is moldy. And that's what it looks like when we get a light on it. Also filled with mouse turds. All right. So we had um, two different people come in and talk to us about 
mold remediation. <coughs> and looking for, and the last one that came in, who really laid out all the costs of all the work for all the collections, um, said it would cost, if you were going to just say, I'm hands off and I'm going to give this to somebody else to clean up, that's $113,000 to do it for all three houses. This is not possible. It's not possible for you guys. It's not possible for us. Um, so I am doing a lot of research on how to do this. I have already ordered the Tyvek suits so that we will do this ourselves. Um, my problem primarily at the moment is that the Ebola scare has made Tyvek suits very hard to acquire. <laughs> Um, I, I have two HEPA vacuum cleaners so that two people can clean. I have the approved uh, fiber lock shockwave disinfectant so that I can work with that, um, sprays, masks, goggles, the whole thing to try to, so that j uh, just a couple of us will be in the basement in the worst of it, feeding the furniture and things out to people who once they're outside, uh, an ordinary face mask and work clothes will be fine. Uh, and we're hoping to get started on, um, I'm beginning to think probably the game the Parsons basement needs to come first. Um, for reasons I think, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards, but it would get too complicated to explain all the sequence. So that's basically me. Uh, at the same time, we're going to pull down the fiberglass because the fiberglass is just creating nests for rodents and, and mice are a big problem in probably all three houses, but definitely that I know of in Parsons and Damon. We also have structural issues in Shepherd House, which I didn't address very much. And so part of what I want to show here really briefly is the context in which your money comes. Hopefully your money comes. Um, I want to put that to the big pro project in Parsons House that we described in the grant. But we need to know that that there are these other projects that also need to be done that we're going to have to spend our money on and we really don't have very much. So uh, in Shepherd House, we have a major leak. That's the outside of it on the left. On the right, you can see that little bit of daylight. Water pours into that basement. I don't know why nobody went and looked and plugged it up. But we have uh, already agreed to have a, have a mason who's supposed to come any day. The sooner the better. I can't wait for a committee to decide about this. I have to get that done. This is what the Shepherd Basement looks like. And um, the plastic is somebody's half-assed attempt at mold remediation. It needs to be pulled up, and all the silt that's underneath it needs to be shoveled out. Um, it's, it's silt that's been deposited there by the water flowing through the basement. Uh, you'll notice that there is a log leaning against it. That's supposed to be holding up the middle of the house. Um, it, it, but there's, the water has rotted the basement, bases of the posts. The posts have fallen over because they've sunk. And therefore, the whole center of the house is starting to sink. This is something that we're going to fix. It's not, it's not the most expensive fix, but it's something we are going to be doing as our part of holding up our end of this project. Here's a third, nobody even noticed the one on the left, but you can see it starting to go in the little circle where it used to live. Worse, and we're not even sure that we understand this problem yet. Um, there's a major, the Shepherd House is a center front hallway house. And so there are these two big beams right under the two walls of the center hall. And they, um, one of them is softening, so the post is sticking, is starting to poke right up into it. So this is going to have to be remediated in some way, and we're in the process of talking about that now. It's causing cracks in the plaster. You can see to the left, and the drop of the, um, the, the sinking of the frame of the house is visible inside the, the closet. In Day and House, our big problem is the windows. I went to uh, move into my new office uh, on October 1st, and I started to wash the windows because I'm a clean person, and the glass fell out. And we started to look at the glass, and we thought, the whole sashes are falling down. And so we found in a room, you see that kind of nice wasp nest in there. That is two inches down in the cell, in the, in the sash. And that is the room where we keep those dresses of that really wonderful costume collection. We had, Chris had to come up the next day and take the windows out. And he has to take out four more um, before we can get through the winter. And the rest of them should come out, but I can't afford to do that right now. 
We've got bulkheads both in Damon House and in Parsons that are completely non-functional and are letting water go into the basements. And today, um, we just noticed that there's some kind of a sinking going on that we can't see very well because there's a ceiling in the main basement um, that is dropping the floors of, of Damon around the fireplaces. The fireplaces are fine, but the, the floors are not holding up. So we're going to have to figure out what that is, and, and we, don't even, we haven't even had time to look into that. So this is the context in which we have to ask for money for an even bigger problem in Carson's house. So Carson's house is a first period um, timber frame house. And if you, could, if you imagine that the place where the little ramp is going up is our back, like a, a, with the back of the house, then that red arrow shows where we have a post which is um, not being supported. The sill underneath it is, has rotted away and the weight of this incredibly heavy two-story post is pushing right down. So that, that is, section is sinking. And this is the beam, uh, the only place you can photograph it, that completely rotten thing that says 1719 sill, is, 1719 sill is what that post is sitting on and that's why it is sinking. This is, and you can see on the little map of the house, I've circled in red where that post is. Um, you can see the evidence of it in the kitchen where the casings are beginning to be pulled down by the, by the downward movement of the beam. And uh, on the, the, in the yellowish colored room, they're actually the same room, it's just the light that's different. Um, I've got two arrows pointing to the area where the sill is, um, is rotting. Uh, this is out of order. I apologize for this. This is another thing that we have to fix before the winter that you won't have to pay for. Uh, the, that rear sill continues off uh, to a point in a room we call the buttery where there's evidence of termite damage. I have not yet had this tested, but Chris looked at it. Um, and when you look, you can see the little tunneling. And the reason we see it in that shape is there were book boxes of books. And the termites came up through the floor, and they didn't know the floor was ending and they were coming into books. It was just more cellulose to them. And so we have that visible, visible uh, thing. Above, on the second floor, where the sill is rotting, the back wall is beginning to fall away from the main part of the house. So I've, I've uh, that little curvy arrow shows you exactly where that corner is on the second floor. And there's a close-up of what that separation looks like. Chris came in and looked at it in probably July, or, and then came in in September, and he walked in the room and he said, whoa, because he felt that this had gotten worse in just the two months. Usually these things happen slowly, but he's beginning to worry that there's an acceleration here. And that's after we submitted the, the original proposal. In the next room, which is directly in line with that post that's rotting, um, the separation is even worse, as you can see in these pictures. And so I kept saying, are you sure it's not the roof? And Chris says, yeah, I think maybe it's the roof. So we went up in the roof. And he and Alicia Spence, a timber framer, uh, and Felicia's son, Elijah, came over to look at this uh, purlin. So you can, in the scheme, a schematic drawing on the left, that's not our house, it's a barn, but it'll show you where the purlin sits in the roof. Um, and it, the rafters are leaning on the purlins. So they took a string and ran it from one end of the house to the other, right along the purlin, and made it nice and taut. And what they discovered was <coughs> that in the middle, right near the rotten post, that the purlin was bowing out and dropping four to five inches away from the, the straight line created by the string. So this is a drop of the roof, and this is the pressure on, that's pushing the outward wall of the house right out. Um, so they said, well, I think we guess we have to do something about that right now. So they went home and they got big straps that you strap cargo onto uh, trucks and um, literally strapped the front and back purlins together to try to keep the back of the, the uh, roof from falling down. It's a Band-Aid. It's not a solution that's permanent. It's 
1981, we put in a cement block basement in this house, in the front, in the of east parlor uh, and connecting to the north L. And we have no problems there. Everything is fine, everything is supported. The, all the problems are in this one area where there is no basement um, and everything is lying directly on the ground. And we really want to get a basement under there um, so that we don't have to go back in 10 years and replace the sills yet again. It's, it's, it's not working. So this is a schematic drawing of where things are. Look, the front is at the bottom. There's an old, uh, probably 18th century basement on the left. That's doing fine. The 1981 basement has stabilized everything on the right sort of driveway side of the house. Um, the little pink side at the far right is a tiny little L, and there's so much chimney foundation in there that that's not a high concern at the moment. But this whole section to the left, this, um, where it says proposed basement, that is, uh, because that's where things are, are really getting bad. So we really need to do this, we need to finish the job, or we're going to be fighting this battle for the rest of our lives. And it's this project that I'm really hoping you can help us with. The Historical Society does not own enough, does not have enough money in any bank account to do this project. If we had to do this project ourselves and there were never any help, um, we would simply have to go out of business, sell a couple houses, or do something really quite drastic you know, if, we, if there were no help outside. So we're, we're trying very hard to do everything in our power to hold up our end, because we know you guys have a lot of places to put your money. A lot of work, we just listened to a worthy project, which I thought sounded lovely. Uh, but this, this organization, I believe, is important to the, the identity of this town. And we need to come to you and ask for your help, or we're not going to make it. Thank you. Questions? Could you talk about community usage of the historic encampment? Well, uh, I can tell you that in this month, no, no, uh, November, we have five programs. We have a spooky storytelling on November 1st. We have a book signing about Northampton State Hospital in connection with that very um, successful memorial program a number of years back. The same woman who did that wrote this book about the Northampton State Hospital. We have Arts Night Out with a new um, exhibition opening. Um, I'm trying to think what the other ones were. Can you remember, Barbara? Because um, I know there's uh, well, there's a film series. The, yeah, there's a film, there's, we do a, a film series. Um, we've been doing for two or three um, sessions, semesters. Um, so that, I know that's happening. We are hoping to have um, what would be a, mem a membership meeting, but probably open to more than just members, but where we have um, a holiday exhibition out and we will <coughs> talk about what we're doing. So that everybody can can um, can know where we stand and, and what we're trying to work on. Um, we have, I think, a, a long way to go. But we have one staff member, Marie Hannett, who's in the office, and there's me. And uh, our board members help. Chris has been wonderful um, and so supportive. But we don't have a lot of people. Um, the board is really trying to step up. Stan Shearer is the one who has organized these programs, and Julia. And we're also, for example, had a series of what we call Jeffersonian dinners, where um, we organize a, a dinner where we invite a small group of people to come and talk about the role. You know, what role should this organization have in this town? So we've been trying to reach out, get a sense of what we should do. Um, I had a, a, a concept for a grant proposal that I want to do with the schools, um, separate to the archaeological one, that um, would involve creating a website um, with an interactive map. I will talk to the guys at UMass who do um, the computer software for interactive curricular website things. I don't remember their exact name. And the concept is to have a map where you can click on an address in Northampton and gradually, um, 
as people put things in, you will see his, uh, historical documents and photos of everyone who lived there. You know, so if you could go to a, um, an address on Main Street and you discover that at one point it was this, and then back in my day it was Beardsley's, and before that it was something else, then you, you'd see pictures of the facade of Ann August when it was kind of daisies from the 60s and things like that. Um, and that people would be uh, um, allowed to put up their own um, pictures and memories of their own houses, and that this is something that children could do in the school, so that they, again, this is a, um, a concept by which we create a structure for other people to fill in with their, to preserve their own history as they see it. Just in follow up, what, what um, degree of collaboration or utilization by Northampton school children has there been? Well, um, I can't speak very well for the, the past. I know that I see, I was the treasurer before I became the director, and I do see occasional times when school groups have come through. Um, but I think it has fallen way off since a, um, a time in the 1990s where they made a real effort to do it. I think the emphasis in the last 20 years was more on publishing and on research. And they made some real, the Northampton book that was done um, for the, the 2004, 2004 or 5, uh, uh, 250th anniversary was, um, it's a good book and it's good to have it in this town. Um, but, but that, you know, people who do one thing well don't always do the other thing well. So, um, but right now there's been a step toward that and mm -hmm. that is that, um, that we have now children from the Bridge Street School who are um, using our Shepherd House property um, for a community gardening project. So I, I should have brought a picture of it. I've actually got one. Um, there are all their garden boxes with cardboard over the grass are, are all in place waiting for the spring uh, when they will do the planting. They've got a big pile of dirt out there now. And when the corn comes spring, they will all be in our backyard garden. And we are delighted to have them. Could I add something to that? Because I mean, for I think pretty continuously there there's use there are interns from Smith College who come and either work with collections, do exhibitions, uh, classes that come from Smith uh, um, to to use. Um, I mean, Nan Wolverton, oh, yeah. former director, brought her class at Smith to use collection items for the classes. Um, I think there have been pretty continuous different programs with. Um, uh, and, and college. particularly with Bridge Street and with other colleges. Um, they're just outside researchers from, you know, somebody who had a relative that maybe started in our camp and someone will come. So we really try and provide this open access as much as we can. I think the issue is that in spite of fi both financial and just other problems during the, uh, the past, I don't know, maybe 15 years, um, we haven't paid as much attention to the collections and the houses are part of our collections as well as what's stored in them. And I think that because now we're reassessing what we need to do, if, again, if we don't save these houses then we don't have the fabric, we don't have the houses themselves and the stories that they tell and the stories that all the objects tell. It's not just a dress, it's the story of a family. And, you know, the, the photographs are, are the, it's, it's, it's histories and it's her stories because we're really trying to develop more, to attract more collections and more items from, from the LGBT community, from the Hispanic community. We're really trying to be more inclusive. It's not just colonial history. We really are collecting into the present and then hoping to preserve all this for the future. So it's really, there really is a lot of interactive use in spite of the kind of shoestring budgets we've had and we have a, uh, not an, we don't have an identity problem, sorry, we have a um, recognition problem that people don't know we're there and don't know who we are. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of work to do in many areas, but, but the sense of impetus right now is pretty amazing. I mean, something new is happening almost every day. Something changes, something gets better. Um, just a, a simple thank you note for somebody who gave us a plate provided two people who want to do genealogical research for us, not just to come and do their own. It's like I tell them, I have this pair of 1860 morning undersleeves. It's 
It's very rare. I've never seen another pair, but they're up there in the collection. And I said, I know that they are associated with Jerusha Williams, and they were given by Martha Woodruff. What can you find out? He's back in 24 hours with this incredible long email about the, the, that it was probably she was in mourning for the child of her husband by his first marriage, and that her own child was probably named for that child. And you know, he's put all these interesting things together, and, I'm, and, and then he passed my name to somebody in Northampton, and that Northampton person said, when can I come over and, and figure out how to work for you? So I think there's this sense of momentum going. Um, and we, we, can't do, we can't do everything, say, with the schools at once. We have to do, we have to deal with the mold and the collections. We have to deal with keeping the houses from falling down. We have to improve our website. We need to, to reach out to the schools. We need to write grants. So it's kind of up, 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 but going, hitting the same areas over and over. We get back, come back to the website, make it a little bit better in a couple of months. We do a little more on the collection. I now have a place for volunteers to work as of yesterday. Oh, you know, Marie and I stayed till 11 last night, getting um, the, uh, work areas created so that we can do some cataloging and also washing windows very, 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 very carefully um, as much as we could and then putting plastic to try to reduce the heating costs. So we were doing all that till 11 o'clock at night working on these different fronts. I could obviously go on for a long time. <laughs> 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 First, we're going to move on for before too long. So if there are no further questions, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was my opinion. The next uh, item on the agenda is the Jackson Street School Playground presentation. to have 
part of a community playground in the back of our school, and that also is part of our commitment to play and safe spaces and educational spaces that was designed a few years ago to enhance the kind of play that our students should have and also our community should have. Um, and we are just very committed to increasing those opportunities for our students and for our community and in building something that we think will enhance those experiences. I have been a part of Jackson Street now for 30 years because my kids went to the school and then fortunately for them I became principal after they left. <laughs> and I have seen over the years the kind of fundraising and commitment that our school has because it, the people who come to our school I think are committed not just to our school but to the community and being a part of an important community. And this committee that I have been watching do their work over the years, this last year, um, is very, very impressive and is one that you can count on, we can count on in our town and in our school to do an amazing job at both fundraising and raising a playground that's going to last and it's going to be here for many generations to come. So I'm really excited to be a part of it again for another raising of the playground. And I'm happy to introduce Tom Neal Duffy. Thank you, Mike. And uh, uh, just noting the use of raising rent, when was there for raising it initially so many years ago and raising it when it came down as well. <laughs> um, so I'm Tom Neal Duffy. I'm a Jeff Jackson Street School parent and uh, I am the chairman of our fine committee, which is really it's, it's an impressive crowd of, of folks. Uh, we have a professional builder on the committee, we have community organizers, we have people with landscape design and architecture training and experience, um, and we have um, working with a very, very strong PTO that has some, some very good um, professional and personal skills at fundraising. Um, that, that so I want you to know that we're gonna be very assiduous at doing private pieces of fundraising. I'm going to just uh, introduce one piece of um, our uh, our vision and our approach, and then I'm going to turn you over to Joe Comerford, who's going to take you through uh, the, the process of getting community input. Uh, and then we're going to uh, turn you over to Mike Lou, who's going to show you our, our design and where it stands right now. Um, Gwen said it really clearly, the wooden structure was a serious community resource. Um, it wasn't just a Jackson Street school playground. Um, and uh, what we're, we're taking a look at this as we, we're looking at this, the school communion has always been not just a school, it's a resource for, for the local community, which some of you may know has, has a high percentage of, of this community's economically disadvantaged folks. Uh, so when we take, when we're talking about accessibility, we're taking, that's a big piece of the vision here. Gwen's really led us in that vision in terms of making the campus accessible to the broadest number of people. And I just want to take a minute to define what we think of as accessibility. Um, first off, it's accessibility to the schools and the school children. Secondly, to the neighborhood. Um, we've been in contact with the folks at Hampshire Heights. Uh, the Housing Authority has, has given us money to help with the design phase of this project. Um, I'll be going over there sometime within the next four weeks to hold a community forum. Uh, so that those folks don't need to come over to the school to, to make it to any of our forms if they can't do that. Um, and uh, so that's, there's the school community, there's the neighborhood community, um, there's the broader community. We know that, that folks come from all over town and some of them are informal research. We know people stop through town and when they're here they make a point to come over to, to the wood structure when it was there. Um, we're also, and you'll see when Mike gets to the design, we're looking at um, handicapped access uh, and, and making this not just an ADA compliant uh, location uh, and playground, uh, but to make it a truly accessible playground. As, as much as that's possible within the constraints of, of working in an existing place and not building from scratch. Um, and I'll let Mike I'll let Mike talk a little bit about that um, when we get to the design phase of that. So I want to thank you again. I want you to know that we're very grateful for your consideration and for your willingness to, to take a look at this project. And I'll turn you over to Joe Comerford. Sure. Hi, everyone. I get to add my thanks. Uh, for all your 
your work from the city. Um, so as Tom said, I'm going to take you through just a, a, a brief overview of what we've done to both seek stakeholder support and investment and actually hear great ideas so that the playground that you're seeing represents the best ideas coming forward from the greatest number of people, the greatest diversity of people, both in our school and across the, the city. Um, so of course, as Tom said, we were concerned about accessibility, so we went first and asked that question, right? We asked the question of the faculty and staff and students. We asked the question of community. We went to city officials. We went to um, members of the civic inf infrastructure, like DPW and the rec department, to say, how do you use Jackson Street? And what do you need from Jackson Street? We know a little bit more about what our students and faculty and staff get from Jackson Street, but we also know that it's this community resource. We went to our city councilors, our school committee members, and asked for their counsel. And all of those ideas built the plan um, and the project as you see it right now. Um, and then we went even further than that. We looked at research. Um, we looked at research in terms of how play stimulates community building, how it breaks down barriers to race and class, how outdoor classroom, which is part of this larger project, can enhance stewardship and a love for the outdoors and build, build students um, into great earth stewards um, and spark in them an interest in science and an interest in, in social science and, uh, and preservation. Uh, so there's just, as you know, I'm sure, reams of material out there that supports expanding Jackson Street's outdoor footprint and really enhancing a greater amount of creative play, not just for our students, but for the wider community. So in, um, in right now, we've put in a shed, which is a, we call it the loose parts shed. And that was because our students wanted a greater ability um, to take out pieces that weren't already structured for them and really experience them. And through this committee and through conversations with the community, we're going to expand that into a community resource. Um, thinking about uh, opening it up to Saturday afternoon play sessions with the community. So that's how our, our thinking's going as we uh, structure this. So as you know, as Gwen said and Tom said, we said goodbye to the wooden structure, but that was the first of the rituals um, that we held as a community to build a greater awareness of what was to come and again, a greater investment on the part of the wider Jackson Street community. Um, so we've been having uh, community meetings and consultations and most recently had a walking tour of the new playground where we had cider and donuts and invited community members to come with their children and dream with us about what it could be. And it was a very rich um, opportunity for us all to get actually even more input. Um, and so uh, th that's where we are as, uh, as we see it right now. That's the, that's the foundation on which the plan rests for this evening. And let me just take you through uh, some new pieces of information um, which you have. Uh, Sarah has uh, 560-something signatures on a petition to you supporting this playground. This is in addition to the many letters, as you know, we were able to collect. I have to say, this has been easy um, for us because there are so many people who are invested in Jackson Street and who have mourned the loss of the wooden structure, who see the need for play, who see the struggles and the resources of Jackson Street, both. They're equally pronounced, right? Jackson Street um, has some high challenges, high stakes, and it also has the most vibrant and rich and widespread community of supporters all at the same moment. Um, so it's not been hard for us to get these 560 signatures. I expect them to be more in the coming days. Uh, people are forwarding it, so that's that kind of um, excitement. Also, you'll see a new revised budget. Let me just tell you some of the reasons for the revision. Um, we were, thankfully, able to work with Mike um, and through working with Mike, we realized that, in fact, we had put too much equipment on this playground. So we were able to um, allow his real amazing creativity to uh, bring some of the landscape spaces forward, which, again, is part of that creative space and outdoor um, space. So we were able to reduce the number of purchased pieces. Um, and we're excited about that. So that's a, a revised bid that you'll have from O'Brien and Son, just to give us a sense. Um, You'll see uh, Berkshire Design Fee. We were working with Mike, um, and we, uh, we we thought, well, perhaps we could do this project on our own, right? Jackson Street is scrappy. Um, we're going to do that. And then we realized that we wanted expertise that we didn't have in house about accessibility, about the best practices of how to structure a playground, um, about uh, compliance, safety compliance, so that we could say to parents, and we could say to the city, and we could say to the community, 
this is a sound structure for you. So we felt we should invest in the planning phase a greater amount of uh, money, and so you'll see that rep represented also in the budget. Um, and Mike actually has helped us refine some of these bids that you'll see. He actually uh, found them quite sound, um, but we were able to um, understand the need for a general contractor, so that language is in here now. It was in your original budget, it just didn't have a name, frankly. Um, but now we call it general contractor, and that's the amount of money that we'll spend in the heavy machinery um, to come in and move the boulders and uh, you know, place the equipment. And I should just say that uh, you had a great question, um, and I think an act, actually an apt question for Jackson Street uh, in your original list of questions to us, uh, which was, um, aren't you going to have volunteers build this? And the answer is yes, um, totally. The, the costs that you see um, in terms of playground installation are the costs where, where individuals with great shovels and great backs and a great spirit, they just can't make it. Um, you know, we need landscape and excavation. Um, we need ground moved um, and you know, tons of wood chips brought in. Um, we need expertise, we need supervisors on the site to make sure that we're gonna place these uh, pieces of equipment well, um, so that of course they last forever. You know, they last forever, but they last for a very long time, right? Part of that is in us setting them up to well. Um, so the the installation costs you see, and we can certainly answer more questions, are in that vein. We we imagine that there will be hundreds of volunteers making this happen. Um, you know, doing everything from digging some holes um, to you know to all of the landscape needs. Um, and beyond. So, and we can tell you about the, the jobs that we've already started to structure uh, for volunteer help. Um, and with that, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. We can go into greater detail uh, in any of the budget or any of the proposal um, later. Hi, folks. Um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the design, but um, before I start, I just want to relate some of my own experiences and to add to some of the thoughts here. I've been um, in Northampton for many years. I've worked in Northampton for many several years beyond that. Before we moved to Northampton, I used to bring my son to Jackson Street School. Um, everybody, I think everybody in Northampton realizes or knows about or knew about the wooden structure. It was, it was an iconic uh, attraction, for sure. And it, it uh, attracted people from beyond the community, myself being the example. Um, I used to come from Greenfield when I lived there to visit Northampton, make a trip here, spend a day in Northampton, etc. Uh, but the wooden structure was always a favorite place for my son to visit. Uh, when we moved here, um, I, I'm always happy to work on community projects. I was involved in the first phase, the installation of the playground here um, in this aerial photo, this, this wooden structure. Um, I was inv I'm involved as a volunteer uh, in the some of the layout and installation of the uh, playground that's in back of the Jackson Street School yeah. and this area. Like, let me hold it so that so that these good folks can see it too. Way. Yeah, no, no, no. Here, here. I'll hold it. You can talk. Um, <laughs> so this area that's outlined in yellow is the uh, proposed area for that includes what's there now plus the expansion. Um, this diagonal line we're trying to respect. Um, the soccer field that's used by uh, the recreation department, I think it's more or less controlled by the recreation department that's used by- We're well scheduled. Right, mm -hmm. by um, the community at the yeah. um, This area includes a large playground area, two areas with swing sets, um, a gazebo, and there's some scattered stones and landscaping in the area. So we, we kind of have a limited area, um, but we're trying to really put lots of play value there because we're losing so much without the wood structure. Um, in the plan view, um, I know it's a little bit difficult for you to see, but the existing area, one is here, and the one swing set is here, and the second swing set is over here. We're trying to maintain most of that. Um, we don't want to spend a lot of money moving things around that we don't have to. There are some small individual pieces, such as stand-up spinners and, and those things that are going to be easier to move, which we, um, which are proposed to be moved to make room to add some um, other elements to enhance the playground. But one of the main features, again, accessibility for the playground, is bringing a walk up. This is the school. Uh, this is the paved area. Uh, it's bringing a walkway up 
winding it through um, the program to a terminus. Uh, we have a winding walk as it goes around and uh, makes its way around the existing trees, for instance. But the curb, the curb nature, you know, of the walk enhances the experience of people using it. It uh, um, enhances a create, it stimulates creativity for the kids that are using uh, the walkway. Um, at the end is a small terminus. I'm calling it a circular room. Um, there, we're proposed to putting uh, put some boulders here for seats, and it's uh, surrounded by an earth form. Um, and one of the things that uh, I was really excited about when I was asked to help out again here is that in the first phase, you know, we started doing some earth forms, but we just ran out of energy and material. We didn't have any more dirt. People didn't want to, you know, use shovels anymore. Everybody went home. Um, there's, as you might know, there's a small little mound there in the playground. And that was our effort to create some kind of earth form. Kids love to climb on rocks and uh, earth mounds. And we just weren't able to complete it. And it's kind of been trampled, um, so to speak. Uh, but here's an opportunity uh, for us to come back and create an earthen mound uh, that surrounds this space, and which can be used for learning, gathering, and teaching, etc. cetera. Um, part of the, the walk also has a small spur here to a uh, custom wood structure. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be anywhere near the size of the existing wood structure, but it's reminiscent of um, you know the existing structure. Um, this 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 wooden custom wooden structure will have an accessible deck, slightly raised, with a ramp um, that connects to the walkway. And some of the features, <coughs> for instance, this is a um, uh, a, a drawing of a representation of the uh, wooden structure. Uh, the ramp would wrap around the back, and obviously this is still in, in, you know, not finally designed, but this is one of the interim drawings that was produced for the structure. But you can kind of see the character, uh, what it's gonna uh, be like. It, it's kind of, I think it's like a boat. It looks a bit like a boat. There's climbing, apparatus, slides, and there will be other things on it, uh, other um, features such as telescopes and maybe talk tubes and, and those sorts of things. Um, the earthen mounds, the, um, I included these photos here from a, uh, a school, another school that has a courtyard with earthen mounds with kind of curvy walks that go in and out behind the mounds. So you, um, I just wanted to give you the sense of uh, what that could look like with you know, the walkway that kind of disappears behind the mound. It's not going to be totally uh, secretive, but it gives the, pe the users that might want to um, go into the mound area some place to gather where there's some privacy, you know, and they can be away from, <coughs> from um, other groups. And in this um, graphic, we have some of the new equipment that's supposed to be in. Uh, but you can see there's these two pieces are handicap accessible. They will be located directly adjacent to the walkway so that people can uh, get off the walkway, transfer to these. Um, a, a, a spinner and a, uh, I guess this is a, a kind of a seesaw. Oh, yeah, it's, a yeah, it's called a wee-saw. But it actually can um, accommodate, I think they can accommodate like up to 10 kids up at once. There are four large seats plus a center area and the thing rocks back and forth. There's also an oodle swing um, that's, also handy, yeah. that's supposed to be accessible. And as you can see from the photo, there's I think there's like five kids on um, there. Um, if I could just say about the swing here, there's also a very small picture, and we can send you these, of uh, actually a, a handicap accessible swing. In your original budget, we imagined those being much more expensive, but we had some uh, some figures that actually were for things that ultimately, after some more research, we realized we didn't need. What we needed something that was much more reasonably priced, um, which you can see here. So that was another reason that our bid from O'Brien and Son went down, frankly. Uh, we, we got exactly what we needed for a fraction of the cost. So. Um, so some of the play value that's uh, included <coughs> in, the, uh, in these items is, you know, promotes health and uh, physical <coughs> fitness, uh, balance, uh, learning as, as, you know, uh, kids are always, always learning how to use these elements. They're not your standard slide and swing. You know, there's some climbing and um, uh, rope features that promote uh, balance, uh, thinking, creative thinking, as you're trying to work your way through these. And part of the layout is using these, uh, as well as um, you know, uh, natural stumps, for instance, to create circuits using uh, 
with the new equipment plus the existing equipment so that kids can kind of move from one piece of equipment to another without hitting the ground as it were. Um, that's a very uh, favorite activity I think for kids to, to take part in and it's a challenge for them as you know, it promotes that thinking as they move through the landscape. So um, I think I'm just gonna end that presentation for the design and obviously if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer anything about the uh, design, the budget. Um, hi. Don't give me the design answer, but just give me the yes or no. Have you solved the drainage for the circular room? Well, that area, it's very small, actually. I mean, it's not a large area that's going to accumulate drain. Um, this, the area up here is rather flat, but it generally drains this way back toward the parking lot. So this is going to actually, if water accumulates off the mounds, which some of it might, uh, during a rain, it, it should you know flow back out into the playground. As you know, the wood chips is very permeable, mm -hmm. so once it gets off the pavement and sheds out of this area, it'll go into the uh, through through that layer. And we should say that uh, Gwen, thanks to Gwen, we met with city officials, Department of Public Works, and all all you know, the um, maintenance from the school. And the issues with water around Jackson Street actually are primarily up front where the wooden structure used to yeah. be. That's one of the main reasons we're not rebuilding. We're, we're not building there. One was the stewardship issue. We wanted to expand what we had. That sounded you know good to us, but also we we consulted um, we consulted a big big table of good of good folks who said don't build there again. The water is significant, whereas in the back it's not. Um, so we felt really confident after their their due diligence on our behalf. Um, the the budget that you just handed out before you start is that supposed to be different from the project budget? I see the bottom line is the same. Yeah, it, it, um, we added um, we took away some things like we took away some of the purchase material cost, but then we added something in the oh, design fee. So actually, miraculously, it is a, a rather the same bottom line. Okay. Um, so uh, it actually all worked out with our tinkering. Uh, but I wanted you to see a more nuanced budget um, with, uh, with it rendered as it is right now so that what Mike just showed you is representative of the costs. If, yeah, um, if I'm reading this right about, um, well, 68,000, over 68,000 is devoted to this structure yeah. no um, yeah it's a little confusing um, the custom built and Dan actually can speak to this Dan Dan's a Jackson Street parent and he's the designer of the structure let me just give you the, the numbers though and then Dan can talk to you sure. more the materials for the wooden structure are 26,070 right. um, and Dan has given us a very detailed and you have that in your packets now of how he came to that 26,070. Then the purchase, the, the building, um, the building costs, we believe that we need skilled carpenters um, to build that. And so the carpenters are then um, enumerated under playground installation. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another 19,000. 19, so yeah, I've moved calculation on my part. So I'm looking at about $45,000 for the, I'm just, one of the questions we always have when we get to the final point of the number is the scalability. Absolutely. So, um, so the, the structure itself, if that's part of it, is, is 45, a little over 45,000. And then looking at the second, the bottom half of the request, an awful lot of educational training um, this year. We were very, very much had a very reasonable kind of stuff, but I'm just trying to identify what, what's it going where. Uh, plus 5,000 in future costs that are not directly needed for this particular project but are, are, are prudent for future um, that's under uh, loose part play item for creators and um, additional funds for repair and replacement fund which presumably is, a, is a looking forward because it, at some point you will need that money in order to fix things. We'll replace Again, that. reasonable accounting, yeah. But it's um, it's 5,000 total, that's what we're putting in, but actually the, what we'll spend to, you know, to fill the shed um, that Gwen actually purchased for us um, is actually we're gonna spend 2,795. Um, that's in real cost. Um, 
of the materials, and that was you know meticulously parsed out too. Is that cost for construction, or is that, is that no, that's, for future use? No, the the actual items to go in the ship are twenty seven hundred dollars for for, and we're imagining they'll last us for about two years, um, and then we as parents thought, well, we want to leave something, um, we want to leave replacement monies, um, so that we can continue to add to this loose parts budget, because our, our as you know our school budgets are are so lean. Um, <coughs> Uh, Jim has been cut so much that there are materials that we can actually uh, we can't lean on the school for this. Um, so that's that's how that breaks out that budget item. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Well, that, yeah, I'm thinking that, that well, I think on inform Jeff, yeah, so, yeah. that what we should do is we can't, we won't be asking for it. Yes, I think we can. 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 So the discussion for everyone here is that um, we have a um, we have a work conflict, so we're going to lose our quorum shortly. However, which means we cannot deliberate under open meetings law. But since you all have been patiently waiting, um, our solution is that we would go forward with the meeting with four members. We're taping it so anyone who's not here, any member who's not here, would also be able to see your presentation. Um, rather than take the chance that asking questions of you would be considered deliberation, I'm going to ask committee members to write your questions down, and then we submit them to the applicants in writing, and that if you would bring get them back to us in writing before. Um, our meeting on the 12th, which is when we'll start consideration, uh, final consideration, we would then have all those answers back and they'd be distributed to all members of the committee. So we'll be sitting here quietly, but, but we'll be listening intently to your presentation. So good evening, I'm Joey Campbell, uh, Executive Director of Valley CDC. Um, and I'm here to talk about the redevelopment of the uh, former Northampton Lumber Yard at 256 Pleasant Street. So we are extremely, extremely excited to have some control of that property. It's a uh, great location for affordable housing. Um, these sites don't come along very often, and we are especially happy that we can uh, have site control of a downtown property. Um, we've I mean, and it's also a great site for public investment because there are a number of complexities on the site that I think prevent uh, private, uh, for-profit developers for, for redeveloping this, this property. Um, also, I think this property development will be a major catalyst for the redevelopment and the revisioning for the Lower Pleasant Street, which the city um, and the community has been very involved with. Uh, we would be adding about uh, 55 households to the community there. Um, as noted in our application, we uh, need to relocate the stormwater conduit that um, is diagonally under the property, uh, and that will include uh, approval by the Conservation Commission and DPW. We also need to deal with the railroad, uh, both uh, Department of Transportation and um, Pan Am, who both retain ownership. Current activities around the site, uh, we had a tech review with the uh, city last week where the different departments and, and committees come together and comment on uh, our uh, draft site plan. Um, we met with a, a property abutter on Monday. The mayor asked us to come in. We met with him and a couple of his staff members today. We have, obviously, the meeting today. We have two community meeting scheduled tomorrow, one at five o'clock with uh, that Ward 3 Neighborhood Association has been working with us to put together. So we have a meeting with business abutters at five o'clock at the chamber, um, as well as we'll have a full PowerPoint presentation there, and as well as a seven o'clock meeting with the um, 
Ward 3, Neighborhood Association at Bridge Street School at 7. Um, and he also attended the Ward 3 annual meeting on the 19th. So, and over the summer, um, Under Secretary Gornstein, Under Secretary of Housing, came out uh, at the mayor's invitation and walked the site. Very, uh, very positive about this about the site. We've also spoken with DATD, Department of Housing and Community Development staff, who are also very interested in downtown site redevelopment of an existing site. Um, as I mentioned in the application, we already have pre-development funding approved for the development as well as acquisition financing when we're ready to purchase the property. Uh, we expect to go before the planning board at the December meeting. We, um, when we receive site plan approval, we would be purchasing the property from Gail LaBarge, the current owner of the property, and we would be um, holding that property until we accumulate all the funding and other approvals we might need in order to move forward with the project. So our current plan, and I know with questions that were asked before, um, with many housing developments, numbers change, both the development budgets as well as the numbers of units as we work through a program. So currently we have 55 housing units proposed with 75% of those um, as two or three bedroom units. Um, our program will be but somewhere between 50 and 60 units and that 75% of, of two and three bedrooms will remain no matter what the number is, and then the balance of the units will be one bedroom units. Right now we're focused on site plan development, and so the configurations of the various floors will change. Um, when we made the application to you, we did not have um, a site plan yet to distribute to you, so you now have the proposed uh, draft site plan and some um, renderings and some massing of what the property could look like with uh, a four-story apartment building with two commercial spaces, one on Pleasant Street and one on Holyoke Street as required by the city. Um, let's see, what else? So we, as you probably know, central business does not require, has no requirement for parking. We have proposed about three quarters of a space per unit we think that this will enhance the marketing of the property to potential tenants um, and also avoid overflow of parking into potential neighboring um, neighborhoods. We also have a minimum of providing about one bike space or bike rack space per apartment and so we're hoping to, um, the site plan shows three locations for bike racks. We would hope they will be covered that will be decided as we look at costs for the project overall. We also expect, obviously, people to walk with the location and use public transportation as well. Um, Valley, uh, at this point, plans to move into the Holyoke location to have our offices. We currently rent space on Market Street. We would expect to uh, move to the Holyoke Street side. Um, no, no plans at this point for the uh, tenant would be on, on Pleasant Street. Um, as you know, we're seeking funding from CP, uh, CPC to support the development of affordable housing. Um, if funded, no CPA funds would be used prior to the point where we have acquired all the other funding for the development uh, and all of the approvals, and we would be ready to move forward. You probably also know that um, because we come early to you and other groups have come to you early that in order to be competitive at the state level, we have to have all of our funding lined up before we go and ask for funding at the state level, otherwise we will not be competitive. Um, also, all residential units will be uh, affordable in perpetuity, um, and obviously we will accept the affordable housing restriction. Um, also, local funding is extremely important in uh, being competitive at the state level. They, uh, DHCD wants to see a strong commitment of funding from not just, not just verbal commitment, but financial commitment from the localities. Um, we have the support of the housing partnership, and we also have a number of community members that have submitted letters um, to support this development. Um, um, we expect our tenants or future tenants to be earning 
generally between thirty thousand to fifty thousand dollars. That's the range of fifty to sixty pounds of fifty percent to sixty percent of mean income, and we are projecting receiving rental assistance for about eight of those eight units that would serve people below 30%, which would be up to $26,000 of income for a household of four. And those folks would be paying 30% of their income. Um, we look forward to a favor review, and I know you're not gonna ask us any questions, so. Not, not now. Not now, right, so we'll, we'll expect questions from you, thanks. So the next presentation is the Look Park Project. Question for the non-applicant, but over to the city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not just stay safe, just because if you're asking questions, then you're fine. Set a few pictures of um, weren't in the package. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the picture with Mark. You did it with your mom? I understand again, and I can't replicate it. It's not just you, it's any meeting that's in this room. Oh, well, he's been having trouble with her. I never know when I get here whether it'll work or not. It's hard to work. Anyway, I can start. Um, my name is Tom Douglas. I'm an architect in Northampton. Um, I've been here for a few projects before. Mostly the, the biggest one is on Academy of Music, and we just finished the interior renovation. Oh, that's, a, that's a picture. So that's a picture of uh, the Lip Memorial Park before the memorial was built. So they were just beginning to grade the front entry. There's a car on the, on the left. Is uh, off center of where the fountain is, is supposed to be in the future. And you can see over to the far right, there's an excavator, a really old fashioned, looks like a steam excavator, digging, I guess, what must be the foundation for either the flagpole or the, um, the garden house, which is the pool house at the time. Um, so anyway, this is a historic preservation project. Um, it's, it's really a perfect example of recommendations made in the Northampton open space plan that says, that we should honor places where history comes alive in the landscape. It's a memorial that was built in 1928. It's 86 years old now. Like I said, it's not a historic building, it's a historic memorial. And it's really the symbolic face for the park. Um, it's symbolic, its symbolism represents a historic time when private citizens donated land and buildings to the city. Um, and thank Fanny Luck was one of these people. After her husband, Frank Newell Luck, died, she donated this land to the city um, <coughs> and put in the will that I think you read in probably the uh, submission we made, but she inserted into the will that the trustees build a handsome and suitable entrance to the park that said Frank Newell Luck Memorial Park. And so not only did she write it into the will as it directed to them, she also gave them the funds to do it. So she gave them $200,000 to, um, to get that memorial built for her husband. Um, that $200,000 probably went a little bit further uh, and built a few other structures. I think built the garden house and the tennis courts and the flagpole. But the very first structure that was built was the, the memorial there. That was a memorial to her husband. It has many other symbols it was a symbol of an era when public parks were kind of a new idea, especially for little towns like this. It was a symbol of the new profession of landscape architecture, and because this was a professionally designed master plan um, done by a landscape architecture firm in Boston. Um, this was the first structure erected, but they have a master plan, which we have a picture of in, in the park, of the entire park facility. Um, which was, I think, a big thing for a town like this. Only people like Smith College could uh, plan and have drawn professionally projects like this. Um, it's really a symbolic gateway to the park, like I said. It was designed when uh, 
Fannie Luck was alive. So I think she was had a hand in the design and the construction of it. She lived down the street, I think. And so she really had a lot of control over the, the um, creation of this, this structure. Um, it was designed in an Art Deco style, which is pretty rare now, but was much more common then. And another thing that's very rare now, I think, in New England, um, is a big fountain feature. The fountain shot up 30 feet in the air, which it hasn't done in many, many years. But um, it was a really impressive structure at the time. And it's very unique and, and very rare right now to have a freestanding memorial at the entrance to a public park like that that still functions. Um, some of the other symbolism is that it's a symbol of a safe, carefully managed, and maintained institution that provides services to the community. It's a symbol to people who drive by the park every day um, to think about the good times they had in the outdoor spaces there. And, and that's why I think that when you're driving or you're walking by the park, you intuitively understand many of these historic symbols and references that are embodied in this fountain structure. Um, but the problem now is that it's really becoming, beginning to deteriorate. It's really starting to fall apart. So maybe we can flip through a couple more of those pictures. That was, that's 30 foot tall spray. That's when it was relatively new. Um, that is uh, from a distance looking across Route 9. That's a little bit closer with the new walls on the left with the wrought iron gate and brand new driveway. Um, and that's it today. So the fountain, I think, squirts up about five feet and it, it doesn't recirculate. The water just um, goes through it and then empties out into the back and it's very leaky. Um, and if you go, and you can see on the Right hand side, that white patch on the wall, that's where um, there was this Art Deco decorative tile up there that was put up originally. It's completely fallen off now. So what's happened is the park has maintained it pretty well over the years. I mean, there's a lot of patches and repointing, new tile work, um, new concrete, repairs to the fountain, repairs to the pump. A lot of that work has been, has gone, has happened in the the, the history of the fountain. But it's, uh, is there one more slide that I can show you? <laughs> so that's a rendering of what we're planning to do, which is a recreation of the, um, the fountain in its original form. But the next one, the next few, um, that, the, the, the original fountain, that's where that tile was falling off. The original fountain it was built in, with some structural flaws in it um, that I don't know how long it took for them to show up, but they're, they're significant right now. One of them is in those tile areas, it's not, the wall thickness is nothing more than tile, concrete, and one layer of brick. And those are the sections of wall that curve out. So there's a lot of out, outward pressure exerted on the outer faces of that wall that's only one brick thick. So these big vertical cracks have developed on the back of that wall um, that now have turned into a hole. So um, the crack goes all the way through and, and right in the middle of it is a big hole that you can look all the way through. So the next slide shows. So the, that is recent. Um, when I first started working on this a couple years ago, that wasn't there. And it's recent, it formed last winter and it's just gonna get much, much worse with new freeze thaw, thaw, freeze -thaw cycles. Um, so there are two real structural problems. One is that thin wall in the back and the other is the frost heaving that happened when the stairs in the front. Um, no, no amount of repair could ever have saved these. Um, no amount of patching could ever stop this from happening. So that's why we're really looking at a new design where um, we take apart the entire fountain. Uh, we uh, disassemble it in a, in a careful way. We keep all the salvageable materials that we can, which is mostly the cut stone with the the uh, text on it, Frank Newell uh, looks name, and then there's some decorative carving in that limestone. It's a soft limestone. So the upper parts of the wall are in pretty good shape, but everything below that stonework is in really bad shape now. I, after seeing how quickly it's deteriorated in the last year, I, I think that it's probably got about two or three years left before that one really bad crack just begins to separate and collapse. So 
Um, none of us want to see the fountain fall in on itself <coughs> because, you know, a lot of that stonework would just be ruined if that happened. So at some point in the very near future, we're going to have to take it apart carefully, number all the pieces, and store them until this project can um, get built. Um, one of the other things we're going to do is a lot of the new parts of the fountain we're going to have remade in cast concrete. So there's a lot of companies around the country that um, you can send a piece of the fountain to. They can make a mold of it, and then they can duplicate it for you as well. So we're looking, we're getting pricing now, which is outside of the scope of what we gave you. Um, we had a, a budget number in there for a new fountain, which I think will, will um, take care of the cost of du duplicating this, but I just haven't gotten a firm price yet. So, so we're going to replace some of the um, materials that failed, like the lower level lime, limestone steps that got so much frost damage. Uh, we're going to replace this terracotta fountain with a matching one um, in concrete. Um, we're going to we're we're going to um, create a slightly different fountain in the future without a pool. It's going to be very shallow, but it'll give the appearance of a pool. So it'll be in, from a distance, like identical to the original. And I can go over those details to you, with you, if, you, if you'd like me to further on. But, um, and then the next slide is an example of a cast stone um, uh, fountain that uh, this company in Texas So there's a great amount of historic and symbolic value to this uh, memorial at the beginning of the park. Entry to the park. This is just an example of cast stone. A lot of those elements in there are cast uh, concrete, but much higher PSI rating. Um, concrete that lasts a lot of weather very, very well, not just like regular concrete. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is this is, I think, a really important historic monument in the city. There's hardly any other monuments, memorials to um, individuals or to events that exist in the city. There certainly aren't any other Art Deco ones, and there are no other ones for the fountain. It's a big, significant memorial at the entrance to this important park in the city. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Sean, who's the director of the park, to um, talk about the funding. How are you? I'm Sean Porter. I'm the executive director for the park. Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly. I was expecting a lot of questions, but apparently we won't be happy those. So <laughs> I'll give you just a brief rundown. Um, right now, we are looking at um, requesting 300000 for the restoration of the fountain. Um, we are also going to the park itself is going to put up 100000 and we are going to do a capital campaign, a uh, fairly ambitious capital campaign, uh, attempt to raise $150,000. Um, one positive note is we have already seen um, some people donate money, not large, large sums, but some money, so we've actually have to help pay for the architect and the engineering. Because um, there are a lot of people who walk the park. I walk the park pretty much almost daily, and I am regularly, I don't want to say assaulted, but questioned as to what are we doing with the fountain, when is it going to get repaired. Um, a lot of people that I talk to who are regular walkers have grown up in the park. Their families have gone there, they've had weddings at the garden house, they've had their birthdays on the train. Um, so as far as like anybody in town, everybody knows Look Park. Um, and another thing about Look Park is I've been in recreation for 20 years. I have never seen a city have a park that's an asset like this that truly doesn't cost the taxpayers any money. It's totally self-sufficient, and I think that's really quite unique. When I go to other directors, they're like, you don't have city funding, and you know, we raise our own funds. And I think that's something that's you know, kind of dramatic, and kind of impressive about the park. Um, we are working on the capital campaign. We have a number of volunteers um, who are diligently trying to you know, get everything organized. It's not a small undertaking. It's our first capital campaign, and we plan to have a successful capital campaign. Um, trying to think at this point is this, and we can't ask questions, but any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, 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 I, I feel that it is, uh, the, the fountain itself um, is a main piece of the park. When you drive by the park, it does reflect what the inside of the park looks like. 
and it does right now actually reflect the inside of the park. We really strive to maintain a beautiful park and you know maintain the grounds as wonderfully as we can, provide safe, great features for friend, uh, families and you know residents to take advantage of, and at a very affordable price. So if we can get that fountain to represent the rest of the park and the rest of North Hampton, we would really appreciate your help. Well, I think one of the questions we got um, back from you, the written questions, was about. Um, why the park couldn't pay for this project on their own, why we had to come to the CPA. Um, so I think that you can. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the things, you know, uh, like I said, we don't receive tax money. We work hard every year to you know, bring in every dollar we can. Um, this summer was a great summer. Next summer might be rainy. Uh, and that really has a dramatic impact on the budget of the park. Um, the trust is used to sustain the park, uh, that's regular operations. And as far as the repairs for the fountain, we have worked very hard to really work on that to keep it as up to date. I mean, 86 years in New England with one layer thick of brick, I don't know much else that would last that long. Um, so, yeah, I think that it's kind of a crucial piece for the park and the court park. Um, let me see. Anybody else? <laughs> Mars section. <laughs> Um, and I do look forward to your questions. I'll be happy yeah, to respond I mean, quickly to them. I will have questions for sure. I'm sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to uh, the last item, which is the Pleasant Street Affordable Housing Project. <coughs> Hello. Uh, how I'm Peter Serafino with Happy Housing, and I want to thank the committee again for the approval of our project earlier this year and uh, some understanding for the, uh, our inability to meet one of the conditions of funding, and thank you again for putting us back into consideration. So thank you. So uh, in light of the fact that we've kind of had over a lot of material in recent months, I thought it may be best to kind of update you as to what's transpired since I was last year and the progress that we've been making on the project. So, um, you know, as you as you recall, uh, have had a uh, has an option agreement with the seller, and we have now uh, extended that option agreement twice. It was a six month option agreement. We extended it for a month. We've just recently extended it for another month, uh, which we believe uh, should be uh, sufficient. Uh, and at, at the end of this uh, period, we'll exercise our option and we'll purchase a sale agreement and expect to close on the acquisition of the property. <coughs> excuse me, within 120 days. Uh, we've also been hard at work, our uh, architect and engineer have been hard at work advancing the design sufficient to the point where uh, we were able to have a uh, uh, construction estimate by a third party cost estimator uh, that came in with a, uh, a project budget that was about 10% over what we had estimated it would cost. So we then proceeded, well the architect proceeded to make some recommendations that HAP has accepted to some val uh, proposed some value engineering items to basically carve uh, to reduce the project budget by about two and a half million dollars, and so I'll tell you what some of those uh, what the three most significant pieces of that are. Uh, we <clears throat> the first option that we accepted was to reduce the total unit count from 80 apartments to 72 apartments. Uh, we would take away, as remember, we had been proposing 80 uh, 80 apartments and a mix of studio and one bedroom apartments. So we're going to reduce the count by four studios and four one bedrooms to 72 apartments. Um, the, we're able to do that without losing any of the apartments that would have been uh, a, a low income housing tax credit units. So there's still going to be 48 low income housing tax credit units. What we've done, as you recall, there was a tier of 10 apartments that were gonna be affordable to people earning up to 80% of area median income, which is in excess of the low income housing tax <coughs> credit requirement. So we essentially eliminated that tier, moved two into market rate, and the uh, 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 so now we'll, we'll now have uh, 48 uh, affordable and 24 market rate apartments. Um, and again, a mix of studio and one bedroom apartments. That was value engineering item number one. Value engineering item number two was, uh, if you recall, we had uh, on the, behind the ground, the, uh, the Pleasant Street frontage, uh, the 3,500 square feet of retail space, which will remain, is going to be some property management offices, and then behind that was going to be covered parking, and then four floors of residential above. We've decided to drop down the rear portion of the building, eliminate the covered parking, the 19 covered parking spaces, and drop down uh, the building. So there'll still be five levels. It'll be a 
half level on the fifth floor. So four, four levels in the rear. So there'll be ground floor residential units in the, in the rear of the building. Uh, and uh, that, uh, again, was done as a way of eliminating all the costs of the, uh, the par related to the parking, the paving, and so forth. Um, it, uh, un for better or for worse, it leaves us with six surface parking spaces, uh, as opposed to the 19 we had originally planned, but um, uh, the uh, zoning does not require that we have any parking. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, and essentially, now we'll just have parking for our management staff and probably for the uh, uh, business owners or managers for the commercial space. Uh, the third uh, significant value engineering item was uh, to switch from essentially an all-electric mini-split heating cooling system for all the apartments to a more traditional gas-fired uh, heat and hot water system. So among those, th and then uh, a minor item was uh, to eliminate a ceramic tile floor in the bathroom and go to a more epoxy floor, um, and but that was a much uh, much less significant. So all in all, those uh, three items will save us uh, about two and a half million dollars and bring the project into line with uh, uh, with what uh, what we believe we can finance. Uh, some of the other things that have happened is we have, and I'm not recalling whether these were all in place when we last met, but uh, CDAC has approved us for a pre-development loan. Uh, we started to draw on those funds. Uh, CDEC has approved us for a property acquisition loan. Uh, so that's ready to go as soon as we're uh, uh, in position to, uh, to move forward. We have a, an agreement with our environmental engineer in place so that once we sign a purchase and sale agreement, uh, we'll be able to do the chemical analysis of the soils. As you recall, the seller did not want a chemical analysis of the soils done during the option period. It's gonna have to wait until the purchase and sale agreement. Uh, so that's something that purchase and sale agreement we expect would get signed uh, probably before Thanksgiving. So uh, let me just see if there's any. Oh, we did have a uh, back in mid-September we had a technical review meeting with the uh, city agencies, uh, as a, and we now are scheduled to go in front of the uh, Central Business Architectural Commission and the Planning Board on November 13th. One of the things that came out of the uh, uh, technical review was that. Uh, city planners had asked that we move the building five feet further back from the Pleasant Street lot line. So under the commercial business zoning, we're required to be have the front of the building within five feet of the front lot line. Uh, knowing that it's a pretty narrow sidewalk there, um, and of course as you get over to Sylvester's, it's only about four feet wide, uh, a little bit better in front of uh, 129 Pleasant, but the city planners asked that we move it an additional five feet back. Um, that means we have to request a special permit. So the actions for the planning board, our site plan review, and the special permit that really is coming from the city, but we, we're you know, in favor of it as well. Uh, and then the uh, uh, Central Business Architectural Commission will review the facade treatments on the bike path side, the Pleasant Street side, as well as the street, street, street treatments that we've uh, <coughs> uh, I think those are about the major uh, items that are changed or that have moved forward since we were last year. So I guess I'll leave it at that. And if you have follow-up questions, we'll respond from that as well. Thank Thanks you. Very much. Yeah. Thank you. Great update. Thank you for waiting. Sure. They're all interesting projects. <laughs> are, are we allowed to ask Sarah about the budget sheet this year? <laughs> This was supposed to be voted on. Yeah. So this is the this is the set aside into the reserve accounts for this year. Um, hold on, hold on. It's, these aren't final numbers. They're just guesses at this point because we still don't know what the state match will actually be. Do you think these make sense to us? And they really don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what's the so bottom line? Is, so it's a, Basically, the law requires that we put aside 10%. And so the first, so what you have is our estimate of, or Sarah, you just asked estimate of how much money we will receive. So those first three are the, uh, satisfied, those transfers, we need, to, we need to transfer them into our reserve accounts for each of those program areas. So open space, historic preservation, and affordable housing, the law requires us to put 10% aside. So we can either spend it or set it aside. Yeah. Our city auditors just prefer that we put it in a separate account so that we don't compete back. So, and then the um, the administrative account we simply fund every year. Again, there's no obligation to spend it, and if it's not spent, it can be returned.
return to the general reserve account. But this is just the, our normal beginning of our, our cycle um, transfer of six, $60,000, uh, which pays staff salaries and the equipment that we need and if we need to. And I would suppose also this is what we paid the city solicitor out of. Um, I don't or, or does he bill the city? I think he, he just has an account with the city. I don't. We probably won't see it all for that. That's good to know. I don't know if it's that detail. Would use him much. So more. this um, one million six hundred sixty thousand is the most that we will possibly get right. this year. That's our maximum state match. Right. It will probably be less than that. Yep. So how, what is the one under that one million fifty two thousand? That's the remainder. After these are out. So that goes into the general fund. That's what we spend on any type of project. It. So we are required to do the first three. We choose to do the sixty thousand. Whatever we have left goes into the non-designated fund reserve, and then also we have our bond obligations, which we are satisfying. So we're asking so, that these be um, appropriated for bond repayment. So one is the Bean Farm bond, and the other is the Florence Fields. So it's a little over. Two hundred thousand is that right? Two twenty-eight, I think, is what was it? Is and then our fall update, John gave us two twenty-eight. So if you add this up, it's one sixty-five and forty-four, two hundred nine. Yeah, two twenty-eight and change. Then after we service our the bonds and we set aside what we have to set aside, you know, the, the simplest question is how much can we give away? That I will have an update for as soon as we know what the state match is, just because it's totally up in the air at this point. Right. I mean, we, yeah, it's, it, we started the year, going back to what John told us, we started the year with $186,000 remaining from our previous fiscal year. Um, that and 40000 more will be wiped out by our bond payments. So if you look at whatever we whatever we get in total, local revenue plus the match, subtract 40,000 from that, and that's what we have for the entire fiscal year, meaning this round and the next round. So if this if we take this number, 1,660,000, then that means that we would have 1.62 million to allocate over two rounds. Over two? Over two rounds. So that means- But in one year. Yeah, that means this, this round, and the spring. And we have, I believe, $3.5 million of requests. Though, yeah, $3.5 million of requests. Though if you look carefully at some of the budget requests, I noted that phase one of the, I don't want to deliver it, but if you just look at your, uh, I mean, obviously some of these budgets will depend on, will depend on phase and requests, so. And then the other piece of correspondence was from Wayne. He asked me to bring this giant check and show Yay. everybody, yeah, hey, giant check. That's great. So this was for the land acquisition that he's coming in for this round. So he is therefore reducing the CPA request by $83,800 to $116,200. I want to make that other one. You got to find the right one. We'll make another one of the change. Yeah. Who we go to to apply for the grant so we can fund all of these great projects? It, um, well, I, you know, it's. Uh, goes to what? We have. Uh, I can't so remember around. So the, the request for the land acquisition is now $116,200. That's a lot of, lot of big projects. Yeah. 116. So. Thanks. A motion to adjourn not being in order since we've lost our form. Move to dissipate. Yes. Move to dissipate. We can't put it up. We can go home and see how the game's going.